coming up. Yeah, they'll get that info, and looking for that info, gauging the reaction, there's nothing unusual about going for that. But there is something unusual, even sinister, about the next reason for why they did it. Welcome back to Political Spirits. I'm your host, Franklin Rye. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, let's talk for a bit about the Democrat proposal to expand the Supreme Court. At the same time that President Biden's commission to study the Supreme Court was being put together, three Democrat members of the House, with the support of one Democrat senator, Ed Markey, filed a bill to expand the membership of SCOTUS from its current level of nine members to a new level of 13 members. The House bill is sponsored by the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, Representative Gerald Nadler of New York. The co-sponsors are Representatives Hank Johnson of Georgia and Mondaire Jones of New York. For those of you who don't know Hank Johnson, I've dubbed him the stupidest member of Congress. Now, admittedly, you might be thinking two different things out there in response to that claim, and those thoughts are diametrically opposed. The first might be, that's a bit crude. Is it really fair to call him the stupidest or most stupid member of Congress? What did he really do to earn that insulting label? The second diametrically opposed thought is there are so many stupid members of Congress that you can't possibly identify the one who's the most stupid. Let me rebut those thoughts one by one. I'll start with the claim that it's unfair to label Hank Johnson the most stupid member of Congress. If you're having that thought, you probably haven't seen the video on YouTube of Congressman Hank Johnson questioning Admiral Robert Willard head of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, about whether the island of Guam will capsize because of the weight of all of the U.S. military bases on it. I'm not joking. He really did that. The exchange was so absurd that Anderson Cooper on CNN admitted that at first he thought it was an April Fool's joke. But go on to YouTube and watch the video. Hank Johnson wasn't joking. Here's what he said so you can marvel at the mental giant that is Congressman Hank Johnson. What follows are exact quotes. Congressman Johnson starts his dissertation with, quote, This is a, a island that at its widest level is, what, 12 miles from shore to shore, and at its smallest level, uh, uh, or smallest, uh, uh, it's uh, seven miles uh, uh, between one shore and the other. Is that correct? Admiral Willard's response, quote, I don't have the exact dimensions, but to your point, sir, I think Guam is a small island, close quote. Congressman Johnson then says, quote, very small island and about 24 miles, if I recall, long, 24 miles long, about seven miles wide at the least widest place on the island and about 20, about 12 miles wide uh, on the widest part of the island and, um, I don't know how many square miles that is. Do you happen to know? Close quote. Admiral Willard's response. Quote, I don't have that figure with me, sir. I can certainly supply it to you if you'd like. Close quote. Congressman Johnson then explains his concern. Quote, yeah, my fear is that uh, the whole island will uh, become so overly populated that it will tip over and uh, capsize. Close quote. Admiral Willard responds, quote, We don't anticipate that, close quote. Anderson Cooper, in a moment of actual journalistic integrity at CNN, then notes that Congressman Johnson's office had later claimed that he was simply stating that the amount of U.S. military personnel and equipment being stationed on the island could be a, quote, tipping point for the island's infrastructure and ecosystem, that he was obviously joking, close quote. Cooper continued with another instance of journalistic integrity when he concluded with, quote, you decide for yourself, close quote. Well, I have. 
Hence, Johnson's title is stupidest member of Congress. But I digress. Does the bill to increase the Supreme Court membership to 13 have any significant likelihood of passing? No, not really. They might not even be able to get it through the House of Representatives, where their margin is now even thinner than before, because Republican Julia Letlow from Louisiana has now joined the chamber. You may recall her husband, Luke Letlow, died from COVID-19 before he could be sworn in. His wife, Julia Letlow, won this special election to be his replacement. That means that the Democrat margin in the House is now only two votes. For any vote requiring a simple majority, if they lose three Democrat members, they'll lose the vote unless they pick up Republicans. Do I see any Republicans voting for the bill to expand the Supreme Court? No. Not even Susan Collins, not even Lisa Murkowski would vote for that bill. So the Democrats would need almost complete unanimity to pass it through the House. But what if it did? What would happen in the Senate? Well, it's not budget legislation. It's not part of the reconciliation process. That makes it subject to the filibuster. If a senator filibustered the bill, it would take 60 votes to invoke cloture to get the bill to the floor. There's no way the Democrats could accomplish that. So the only way to pass the bill through the Senate would be to abolish the filibuster. Could the Democrats get to 50 votes to abolish the filibuster so that Kamala Harris could then step in as president of the Senate to cast a tie-breaking vote? It's unlikely. The Democrats couldn't lose a single vote vote, but it looks like they would lose Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Kirsten Cinema of Arizona, and possibly more. I know that's close, but it does look like there's almost no way that it could pass. Now, in saying that, I understand that the Democrats have moved so far to the left that we can't rule out anything, but it does look like there's virtually no way the Democrats could pass the court-packing bill. If so, Why did these Democrat members of Congress file that bill to expand the membership of SCOTUS when it looks like it's virtually certain not to pass, rather than waiting for the findings of Biden's new commission? Well, what does it get them? It can satisfy at least some of their left-wing base by showing that they tried. One of the most common things that happens in Congress is that a member of Congress files a bill that doesn't go anywhere, and they know it. Doing so was a favor to a favored constituent, perhaps a contributor or an influential business person or corporation or state or local politician or other public figure. The sponsor knows it isn't going anywhere, but he can then tell his constituents he tried. We'll take and then expand that to a larger scale when you're talking about satisfying your left-wing base rather than simply satisfying the contributor or prominent local company. From the moment that bill is filed, its sponsors and other Democrats can point to it and say to attendees at Democrat functions that all we need is for more Democrats to be elected to get this passed. All we need is your contributions and your votes. So is that it? No, there's more. By filing the bill, the Democrats have an opportunity to gauge the severity of the reaction. Does the public really care? Will there be a major upwelling of support from Democrats? How severe will the adverse reaction be from Republicans and independents? How will the media cover it? Yeah, they'll get that info, and looking for that info, gauging the reaction, there's nothing unusual about going for that. But there is something unusual, even sinister, about the next reason for why they did it. Filing the bill sends a message to the Supreme Court. Even though it's highly unlikely to pass, the fact that it's a pretty close call for such a monumental development is a warning to the Supreme Court. It's a warning from the Democrats that if you start striking down their overreaching efforts, whatever form they may take, a wealth tax, for example, we're going to try to pack the Supreme Court, and we mean it this time. That's sinister. We should all be able to agree that the Supreme Court should be rendering its judgments based on the law, not on politics. One of the most negative results of an actual successful attempt to pack the court would be to remove much of the court's legitimacy. And you know what would happen. As soon as Republicans gain sufficient control to expand the court further, 
to re-secure a conservative majority on SCOTUS, they would. In the end, we could have a court two, three, four, five times its present size. It would no longer be a court. It would be another legislative body and an unelected one at that. It would be an absurdity. I can't believe that any member of the Supreme Court wants that. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was perhaps its most liberal member, and she opposed it. By filing the bill, Democrats are trying to threaten the conservative members of the Supreme Court to try to push them not to overturn the leftist measures they have in mind or they've already passed. Think about the Green New Deal. Think about how far Democrats are willing to push federal power in the context of pandemic response. Now take that attitude and apply it to their response to climate change. There's no telling how far they'd go including beyond constitutional limitations. But if the Supreme Court is too concerned about the possibility of a further pack-the-court push, maybe, just maybe, the court will take a lighter hand in response and will be less likely to overturn the Democrats' extreme actions. And it's that possibility that I suspect the Democrats had in mind. Sure, it doesn't have widespread sponsorship at this point, but that serves the party's purpose. Joe Biden can continue to satisfy many of his voters who wanted a moderate by pointing to his simply looking into the issue. Members of Democrat leadership can maintain that same facade based on the limited sponsorship of the bill. But the fact that Gerald Nadler is among the sponsors and he's one of the more prominent Democrat members of Congress helps deliver the message to the Supreme Court that this is serious and that the Democrats are serious about their threat. Think of it as a continuation of Senator Chuck Schumer's threat to SCOTUS when he issued the threat that if they restricted abortion access, quote, you won't know what hits you if you go forward with these awful decisions, close quote. The filing of the court packing bill is a continuation of that same threat. Incidentally, Chief Justice Roberts went on the record saying that Schumer's threat was, quote, inappropriate, close quote, and, quote, dangerous, close quote. Additionally, there is another possible angle to explain filing the bill. It may be that it's seen as a way of prepping the public with the more extreme proposal, actual court packing by expanding the court and then having Biden, perhaps through the commission he created, propose something less extreme or at least less immediate, such as Supreme Court or federal judge term limits or an attempt at a Supreme Court code of conduct, which would be at risk of being overturned by the court itself, though. Those proposals could then be pushed as moderate because they would be compared to the court packing proposal, which Biden at this point seems to have opposed or at least not endorsed, to the extent we can decipher what it is that he's actually saying. Next topic. This week's sign that sanity may be on the horizon. I've talked recently about when I see the latest instances of left-wing lunacy, I think in terms of the title of the old Sports Illustrated regular column entitled, This Week's Sign the Apocalypse is Upon Us. And as you can imagine, I have plenty of reasons in the last few weeks and months to think that. But every now and then, I see something coming out of a decidedly left-wing location that makes me think maybe, just maybe, things are going to turn. Maybe, just maybe, it's this week's sign that sanity may be on the horizon. So what's a recent example of that? Think about the lunacy we've seen coming out of the west coast of the U.S., California, Oregon, Washington, three states of undeniable beauty, three states of undeniable fertile agricultural productivity. Stare with awe at the Yosemite Valley in California, head east out of Portland, Oregon, along the Columbia River Gorge with the mighty river on your left and waterfall after waterfall on your right. Head north out of Seattle, drive your car onto one of the numerous ferry boats and spend the morning looking for orcas as you gaze out at rocky forest-studded coastlines as you await disembarking at Friday Harbor or one of the other towns in the San Juan Islands of Puget Sound, gradually feeling yourself adjust to island time as the stress flows away like the salt water passing below you. Now think about how those states with so much going for them are spoiled by the incompetence, the carelessness, 
the historical ignorance of government so far to the left that nothing seems quite foolish enough for them to refuse to consider. Think about the failures of the California response to COVID, the dramatic overreaction from Governor Newsom and Los Angeles Mayor Garcetti. And it didn't take long for that overreaction to kick in. Remember those absurd videos of police in Los Angeles chasing down a paddleboarder alone in the ocean and arresting him for a COVID violation? Perhaps fearful he would catch the virus from or transmit it to a jellyfish, a sardine, or perhaps crush the sea turtle from Finding Nemo. Yeah, I know that turtle wasn't in California. He was riding the East Australia Current, after all. But he sure sounded like a Southern California surfer, dude. Think about the absurdly anemic response of Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler to night after night of rioting, incredibly culminating in city leaders deciding to carve $16 million from the police budget, leading to, you guessed it, a spike in homicides. In fact, by mid-March, the city had seen 20 homicides compared to one during the same period in the prior year. Now think about Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin's incompetence in the Emerald City. Think back to her absurd reference to the armed takeover and occupation of a section of her city by political extremists, by separatists, literally declaring a portion of that city, including a police station, to be an autonomous zone, alternatively referred to as CHAZ or CHOP. Regardless of the acronym used, it was beyond absurd for Seattle leadership, including the mayor, to let it go on for so long. She didn't just let it go on, she downplayed its significance and said it could simply be a, quote, summer of love, close quote. Instead, it turned into the site of multiple shootings and killings, and the site of residents living in terror because police abandoned the police station and fire rescue was largely blocked from access by the occupying armed protesters holding the zone. So that's some of the lunacy. Where's the sanity? What happened recently that gives me some hope? Well, it's a recall. It's a recall election, the West Coast equivalent of a do-over. Years ago, it helped California when they came to their senses and threw out their incompetent governor, Gray Davis. Alas, it didn't prompt them to abandon leftist lunacy going forward, but at least in his first term, Arnold Schwarzenegger was a hell of a lot better than Gray Davis. And it's helping California now, as incompetent Governor Gavin Newsom is being subjected to a recall election and may actually be thrown out. But we all know about that recall. It's received quite a bit of publicity and over 2 million signatures. I'm talking about a different recall. It's much smaller, but still worth watching. I'm talking about the recall of Kashama Sawant, a socialist member of the Seattle City Council. This month, the Washington State Supreme Court ruled in favor of the effort to recall Ms. Sawant from office. The State Supreme Court considered four separate grounds for the recall. It concluded that three of them constituted sufficient legal justification. Sawant faced four charges. One, using her access key to open City Hall to protesters who occupied it during a time when it was closed to the public. Two, leading a march to the mayor's home, even though it was a confidential address under state law, due to the mayor's former role as a U.S. attorney for the state. Three, using city resources to support a tax Amazon ballot initiative and failing to follow public disclosure requirements regarding that initiative. And finally, four, turning over the hiring and firing of office staffers to the political organization, the Socialist Alternative. The state Supreme Court upheld the first three grounds I just referenced. As to the last one, turning over hiring and firing to the Socialist Alternative, the court held she was free to consult with that political entity and therefore disallowed that reason for recall. Their conclusion that the first three grounds referenced were sufficient to support a recall does not mean that she's removed from office. It simply means if sufficient signatures are collected from her district, she'll be subjected to a recall election. The number needed is approximately 10,000 signatures. We'll see what happens, but I feel about Seattle Councilmember Sawant the same way I feel about Governor Gavin Newsom in California. The sooner they're recalled, the better. 
But when it comes to podcasts at Political Spirits, the wait is always the same. I'll be back in one week with another episode, so be sure to listen and tell your friends to do so as well. And like the podcast on Facebook at Political Spirits and follow me and the podcast on Twitter at Franklin Rye. And remember, all episodes are now on YouTube as well, and the YouTube channel is named Political Spirits Network. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. And select all after you hit the bell. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening. Thank you.